Hi, everybody. My name is Alan Catliff with the IFA. Thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Franchise All Forum and revolutionizing franchise marketing, unveiling unique 2024 marketing tactics. We're going to give it about a minute just to let everybody join and get settled, and then we'll kick off. PM. All right, so I see we have a vast majority of people already in, so we're going to kick it off again. My name is Alan Catlin with the IFA. Thank you very much for joining our webinar this afternoon. Quick IFA pitch before I turn it over to Sam Ballas, Chair of the Franchise or Forum. If you haven't yet registered for convention, what are you waiting for? December 15th is the end of the early bird. To register, go to franchise.org slash convention. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, everybody, for taking the opportunity and the time this afternoon to join us for this uh, sixth installment, I believe it is, for the Franchise or Reform Educational Series. On behalf of uh, Robin Gagon, who's on with us today, and Karen Satterley, who is not because she is in Singapore, uh, we welcome everyone, and we're excited. We're having a, a really nice session for you today. Um, I'd ask Ashley of Massage Heights to help us with um, driving an idea for marketing into 2024, and I won't take the thunder away, but Julie Green is going to be moderating from us today from Massage Heights, and not to waste any time and get into the cool content. Julie, it's yours. Thank you so much. And again, just to echo what Sam said, thank you all so much for being here today. We have a fantastic group of marketers to guide us as we explore strategies and tactics that are set to define marketing in 2024. So we're here today to give you a ton of insights into initiatives that you can take back and put into your 2024 plans. A little bit of background on me. Um, as Sam said, I'm on the Massage Heights team with Ashley. I have been in the franchising industry for about 15 years, multiple years in the home services industry, spent a few years over on the agency side uh, before moving over to Massage Heights about a year ago. So super excited to be here today. Um, and like I said, we've got the best of the best. So I'm going to let them give a brief intro and background about themselves. Ashley, we'll start with you. Thanks, Julie. Um, so I'm Ashley Mitchell, not Ashley Schutz, who's the <laughs> Ashley that Sam and Julie were referring to, um, but adore her. Um, I've spent my entire career in marketing communications roles. I started in franchising um, when I fell into it, as most people do, in 2014 um, after a six-year stint with the Walt Disney Company. So I've held several positions in which I've been responsible for creating and driving marketing strategy, overseeing the growth of the business through all aspects of marketing communication, as well as contributing to overall strategic planning as part of company executive leadership teams. So my experience spans consumer franchise development and M&A and several industries in the franchise space, including youth enrichment, QSR, beauty concepts, and B2B services, to name a few. All right. And Catherine? Everything that Ashley said, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about my specific experience. The last 10 years leading franchise marketing uh, for brands like Smoothie King, Painting with a Twist, Small Sliders, Salad Station, and today I'm representing Go Minis um, as their chief marketing officer. Um, so uh, vast uh, industry experience and um, excited to be here to share some of that with you guys. All right. And Lindsay. Uh, similar to Julie, actually, my background started 15 years ago, also uh, in the multi-unit space, then into franchising. Also had a stint in the agency and consulting side uh, for a few years before started working with Stretch Zone now um, four years ago as a consultant and now in-house as a VP of marketing. So I've uh, been around the brand for a while and been in-house now for a year. All right. So thank you all for that. And now we're going to get into it. So we are all in the place of reflecting on our 2023 tactics, what worked, what didn't, and we're all 
trying to finish up by finalizing those 2024 budgets as we get into the end of this year and looking into next year. So Catherine, let's start with you. What was your biggest marketing win in 2023? Uh, 2023 was definitely a year of learning the consumer again. Um, and so I would say that my biggest marketing win was starting to think about um, what uh, alternative revenue streams I could bring to um, the brands that I work with uh, in order to expand that consumer base. And so specifically an example is um, restaurant catering. Uh, so, you know, revamping and um, focusing on uh, catering in order to um level out uh, the, the decline in guest traffic that we were seeing. Um, and we were able to increase um, catering sales 40% year over year during the time of the campaign. So it's always fun when you have big numbers like that to report back on. Definitely. Ashley, how about you? Any big wins as you look back on the year, what you saw? It might seem silly, but getting people to actually adopt and do local marketing again. So we all saw kind of what happened, you know, over the past few years, 2019 things as usual, 2020, it's just survival mode, you know, getting through whatever was going on, 2021, 2022, all of a sudden there's massive demand and not enough supply, especially in industries where you count on your employees to be the bread and butter of what you're doing. And so all of a sudden there's all this demand and no, you know, supplies limited because no one can find anyone to hire. And so locations started saying, well, I don't need to market. I don't need to do marketing because the demand is super high. I can't even staff what I have. So I'm turning people away. So I'm going to stop consumer marketing. So we had to convince them not to in 2021 and 2022 and understand the balance of what it looks like to maybe pivot some of your local marketing down the recruiting side, all of those different things. But then in 2023, those people that had stopped or only did what they bare minimum had to do, realized all of a sudden, oh, wait, people are not just coming to me anymore. I might have to actually do something. And so it was really a re-education of what do you have to do to get back out there and that you do have to invest in marketing. And the floodgates of that demand once everybody came out of, you know, pandemic days as much as we have, um, it's not just there and that you have to do something. So as silly as it is, the biggest win was getting people to actually do stuff at the local level. For sure. Catherine? I'm going to let Lindsay take the next Oh, one. I'm sorry. Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> Totally fine. Yeah, I think to jump off what Ashley said, same thing here. For us, it was um, a lot of focusing on back to basics and community involvement, not just, you know, hanging our hats on the, the promise of digital leads being the end all be all and, and really thinking about omni channel marketing and what are all the different pieces of the marketing pie that we have here and how are we allocating the appropriate time, energy, effort and resources to support our franchisees in those different marketing initiatives, whether it's community events or partnerships. Um, or even some fun guerrilla marketing tactics. Uh, that was really the focus for a lot of us um, this year. And I think some had some really nice wins with some kind of viral things in that, that capacity. So something Catherine said kind of struck me and which takes us into our next question is 2023 was an interesting year because I think consumer behaviors have been so heavily shaped. And, and Ashley, you touched on this too, coming out of the pandemic those those consumer habits have shifted very much into 2023. And Catherine, because you kind of got this train rolling in, in my brain, which was a great segue to this next question, what consumer behaviors did surprise you in 2023? And then how are you prepared to address that in your marketing efforts going into the new year? Yeah, and I think Ashley really nailed this when she kind of described um, how, how the, the, it, to me, it was a sudden shift um, from 2022 to 2023. And I, I personally was excited to talk to peers of mine to hear that everyone, all industries, um, were really experiencing the same shift. And, and you know, I think um, Ashley was right. It was kind of, you know, this, this pent up supply and demand um, release for 23 then created um, almost a, a, a pullback. And the issue was that we were hearing from the news and from, you know, talking heads that, this consumer spending is at all time highs. Everybody's out and, and doing this spending, but the distribution of that spending, I think, um, you know, created some unrealistic expectations as to what we could expect out of 23 when comparing it to 21 and 22. Um, and so for me, the biggest surprise was that shift. I didn't expect it. I didn't know that was coming. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure out how to adjust to it. And I think Ashley and Lindsay both hit on this where, you know, we fell back on 
the how do you do traditional marketing and word of mouth marketing and getting out in the community are never going to not be the thing to do. Um, and so, you know, it, it is that re-education and, and building back up that muscle memory that I think has been the biggest challenge for marketers in 23 is, is kind of, um, you know, talking about that, uh, being on the bullhorn about that. Um, and, and, also communicating that it is a consumer behavior change and it's something that we need to prepare for moving forward um, versus it, it you know, being something that the brand is doing wrong. It, it's a change and we need to adjust to it. And, and that's, um, that's that was my biggest surprise was that that change happened and, and we had to adjust for it. And I think to piggyback off of that, like that change happened and they were, you know, all the spending in the market. And then all of a sudden it was inflation. And that was what we were hearing is that everything costs so much more money. But the thing is, is that people are willing to spend if you make it worth it. And I think that comes back to customer experience. And I think over the years, that's become more of a marketing thing. Is it solely marketing? No, it's not just the marketing team or department or whatever that owns it. It's shared among you know operations and every part of the business touches customer experience. But I think that it's shifted more into the marketing realm to own what is that customer experience so that people know what they need to execute. So people are seeing that they get the value. It doesn't mean that people are not going to spend. Everyone has raised prices across the board. It's happened. It's continued to happen. Happen. doesn't mean that now that you know we're in this spot where maybe people are not spending as much and they're not just the demands flooding at you to drop those prices it's how are you showing the value for justifying what you're charging um and then also it's just people are used to instant gratification so what can you do to make sure that people are getting the answers they need as quickly as they need them because they will move on to someone else so i think that's something that's huge has been huge, but will continue to be huge going into 2024 is that speed to getting to the customer and getting them what they need to know to make the decision to go with you instead of someone else. Yeah, Lindsay, any any thoughts from you or anything that overly surprised you in the past year? Yeah, I think if I can take the, the question a little bit of a different route, something that was super surprising, I think for all of us, perhaps is the uh, meta change over last summer for the targeting, right? So that was something that I know in the digital space affected every single person um, from being able to target to lives in or resides into only recently has been in and you know high level that change. I mean, I know that really impacted all the campaigns we were running on the local and digital world because all of a sudden now, just because somebody's been in your location and was driving by on vacation or whatever have you, now they're seeing your ads and your ad dollars are going to people that are at least in our business that are not real potential long-term clients. And so that was a real shift in terms of our kind of sales process and onboarding and, and welcoming people to the studios is to confirm that they're actually residents in this city and they weren't just visiting because, you know, we've got locations in, in 41 states now. So there was a lot of overlap and, and a bit of confusion at that time when that algorithm change happened of people thinking they were booking perhaps at one studio, but were at another one just because they had recently traveled by one, for example. So that was a big change in that algorithm last summer that, um, that definitely took a little bit of adjusting for us on our side. Definitely. So all three of you have hit on a few different tactics. You know, we've heard guerrilla, grassroots, local, um, which all encompassing for sure. And then with the social media, um, Lindsay, I'll keep it with you just to, to continue what you were saying. Is there a marketing tactic that you anticipate will have the most impact in this new year um, as you're thinking through that surprise and then other tactics, anything that you think is is going to be the thing, you know, the impactful to focus on for the new year? I don't think that there's one silver bullet, at least as it pertains to us in our business, um, you know, or marketing in general. It's really omni-channel and the way we approach things over here is what is the host of things, whether it's three, five, seven activities, whatever it is that, that are going to make up our marketing mix that we want to focus on. And, and really, I think a lot of it is back to basics you know, really involvement in the communities, being present, doing events, networking, wellness things for our, our clients and our studios. So a lot of it is really this back to basics. And I think, you know, oftentimes the pendulum swings really far one way to another, right? When we were moving to this world that seemed almost exclusively digital, I think, you know, people are lacking that connection and that, that human interaction. And now in this post-pandemic world, as you mentioned before, we're back to more events and, and in-person things that I think are going to be a real driver for us in 2024. Yeah, so I want to a lot of nods. Oh no, Catherine, go ahead. I love it. Um, so I, uh, to piggyback on what Lindsay is saying, um, I also think that there's an opportunity. So 
first of all, at, you know, no silver bullet. That that is a given. That's something that we have to uh, manage too um, on a consistent basis. Um, I think that the the it's going to be interesting this next year to see what those new tactics um, emerge as because digital buys and efficiency um, and effectiveness is so significantly down. And so you do have to start experimenting outside of it. Um, I would say that in addition to the back to basics that Lindsay is talking about, as far as the, that human connection, there needs to be a back to basics on what is your foundational customer journey infrastructure. And um, I think for two what I have seen is that brands kind of depend on either search or social to drive, uh, you know, traffic into whatever they're trying to drive into, whether it's a website or a physical location, and they have neglected the nurture. So creating, you know, strong foundational nurture um, uh, activations, uh, I think a lot of brands are going to be looking in the mirror to say, hey, are our nurture campaigns, what I mean by that is, um, email campaigns, um, you know, mapping your customer journey, understanding where you're touching them. Mostly it's going to be digital, but where you're touching them on that customer journey so that you're driving them back in. Um, that I think is going to be a, a back to basics that the headquarters teams are going to have to look at so that you have that strong foundation so that when you're encouraging the franchisees to get out into the community, they have the foundation um, for that nurture campaign to really um, amplify those efforts. And also to that point, focus on what else are you doing to retain, not only nurture new leads, but what are you doing to nurture the leads that you have and your current customers? And what are you doing to have that retention? As Catherine mentioned, all of the, you know, digital's harder and harder to make yourself heard and you still have to do it. This is not me saying, and I guarantee it's not Catherine or Lindsay saying, don't do it either. Um, it's something that you have to do and you have to have that base but you can't just do that and just rely on that. And I think a lot of, you know, in the last three or four years, a lot of people have relied on that as because it was the only way that you could get in front of people. So that's all they did. So I think people are so on the like chasing new leads a lot. And especially at the location level, this tends to happen where they want to chase the new leads because they want to get more people in, but sometimes neglect the people that you already have. And so, you know, you, we all know it costs more to get a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. So what are you doing to that existing one? Going back to that experience and making sure that they're seeing the value and turning those people into advocates. What are you doing? It doesn't just happen. Sometimes people, you know, there's something that you're doing that makes that person become an advocate for you and spread that word of mouth for you and all of those different things. So that's something I think a lot of times people are just so head down in the day to day that they forget about. And on that note, and just from a franchisee level, you know, our team is consistently, as I'm sure you all are, um, having conversations about those franchisees and how their business owners and sometimes, oftentimes new business owners and marketing isn't their area of expertise. And it is a very large part of that business ownership, but it's not the one part. So how do you, speaking on that foundation on that, you know, how do you empower your franchisees or how do you in, in, uh, support them to implement these effective marketing tactics? Um, Catherine, we'll we'll start with you for this one. But again, just like supporting and empowering your franchisees to be those those good marketers in their local communities. How do you do that? Um, you know, it's it's just hard. Um, and I think that um, you know, you can we can laundry list the things that that you need to do. You need to develop playbooks so that they are systemized and that you can you can you know have a step by step guide. You need to have coaching um, opportunities on a regular basis. And and I would challenge us to start thinking about how are we. Um, coaching not just the franchisees, but coaching the people who talk to the franchisees, right? So are you incorporating your operations team into your marketing plans, why it's important to market in this, this capacity so that they can echo what, what you're saying? We know as marketers that um, frequency of message and consistency of message are key to breakthrough to the consumer. Well, the franchisee is a consumer. So how are we being consistent um, and how frequent are our messages in order to, to kind of drive that down? And I think at the end of the day, it really does come back to coaching and accountability to get the franchisees to um, activate on the things you want them to activate and making sure that that list is as small as possible. Uh, but I know Ashley and Lindsay are going to have much smarter answers, so I'm going to ask them to jump in. <laughs> Hardly. Definitely not. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if you don't mind, Ashley. Um, I think for there's a few different pieces of that. Um, one, my unofficial motto around here is it's really hard to make things really simple. And with everything that we do, 
uh, try to do it under that guise. You know, how do we make this really simple? Because all of us, you know, marketers, we've got perhaps an enhanced knowledge compared to maybe some of our franchisees of different tactics or different execution or just marketing in general, right? So how do we bring it down to say, okay, how do we make this the most simple so that it can really be executed efficiently? Because another thing I, I say all the time is, you know, ideas are easy. Everybody, lots of good ideas, but how do we execute them and execute them well across the entire network? So, so over here, it's, it's really a focus on how do we make things really simple uh, so that we can support our franchisees well, and then how do we make sure that what we're doing is easily um, actionable in different markets in different sizes and, and with our group specifically, most of our owners are multi unit owners, so it's not just a singular execution of a for one location do X but for those that have three, five, seven, twenty 20 locations, how do these plans scale and so different initiatives we've done we've tried to put together almost a good better best. And not that one is better than the other, but generally in terms of activities or volume, so that there's there's more of an option and an opportunity for the plans to scale either with the budget of a franchisee or a different location or a group of, um, of franchise locations together. Lindsay hit the nail on the head that you have to have the optionality in there because if you don't, if you don't realize that all of your franchisees are going to be a little bit different, they'll all tell you, right? Like every franchisee will come to you and say, well, my market's different. You're right, it is, because every market is different. However, you have to make sure that you're giving them the tools and resources within the box, but the box is big enough for them to decide what makes sense for them and pick and choose what those things are. And then also what things you're going to allow them to put a local spin on and what things you're not. And there is, you know, we have all talked about community events and grassroots and local marketing and how important that is. At the end of the day, all of your franchisees are local businesses. There has to be an opportunity for them to put their mark on it. But how do they put their mark on it without changing the brand? And so that balance, you have to give them in some way, because if you don't and you just say, here's list A and you have to do everything exactly the way that it is on list A and here's list B and you have to do it exactly the same way. One, they're not going to do it. Two, they're not going to be invested in it. And three, they're probably going to go rogue because you're being too strict. So you have to get that balance of what is strict enough for the brand so that you're not you know, letting them go change your colors to green or something like that. But then also what is gives them enough flexibility to feel ownership of it to get them to actually execute it. Well, I love that making the box big enough and having enough in that box for them to be able to pick and choose. I love that visual. Um, and speaking of, of things in their box, um, social media is always another big topic of conversation um, amongst our team, as I'm sure it is on all of yours as well. How do you prioritize social media when you're thinking about giving them options to put their stamp on things and when you're giving them you know, choices um, in terms of the brand? How do you prioritize that? And then in turn, like, how are you supporting your franchisees through that process of being strategic and prioritizing with social media? Ashley, you want to? Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. Um, so I think that it's a balance. First of all, it depends on your brand and where people are and who your consumer is on what social media channels you should be on. Let me say that again. It depends on your brand and who your customer is, what social media channels you should be on. Just because there's a new one and there's a new shiny object does not mean that you need to be there. And your franchisees will probably tell you that you need to be because they're also hearing, they're watching Good Morning America and the Today Show and hearing about the newest thing and then coming to you and saying, well, what's our TikTok strategy? What's our strategy with chat GPT? All of these things. They're hearing the same things, maybe not to the extent that we are, but they're hearing the same things. And so you're going to get those questions. And so being able to back up why you are or aren't doing something is super important, first of all. Um, second, when you decide what those channels are, they are important because again, going back to what I feel like we've said probably 75 times already, being part of the community is important. And that's where they can take that and have a little bit of liberty with it. But having those strict guidelines of what they can and can't do so that they're not going out there and creating brand content that somebody else then will pick up. Franchisees follow each other and they should because they should get ideas from each other. But you don't, the worst thing is, and this happens, happened to me, it's happened probably to everybody else on this call. One franchisee thinks they're being super creative. They go and run with something. Then it trickles down and a bunch of people are doing things that from a brand perspective, you don't want them to do. So trying to set that stage up front of like, here's where you can be creative and here's how you can be creative. If it goes above this, escalate it to our team and we can help you. So positioning it in like, you're going to have the best ideas because ultimately the franchisees are going to have the best ideas. They're the ones that are living and breathing the operations of your business every day. You're not. And so they're going to have 
recognize a challenge or see something that's a good idea and building that relationship with them early and often so that they do come to you with those ideas in a way that you can say, let us help you. You don't have to spend and you shouldn't spend hours of your day creating TikTok videos. You have a business to run, but come to us if you have a great idea and let us help you figure out how to do it. And then maybe it's something we can trickle to everybody. So I think it's really important to have that like standard and I also think it's important that locations and franchisees are the ones that are ultimately responsible for their local social media channels because they're going, that's how a lot of people communicate with you. So customers are going to send in messages. They're going to put a comment. You're going to post a picture of something that's just like a brand specific thing that talks about one of your programs or something and has nothing to do with the community. And someone's going to comment and say, what time are you open today? They're going to know that they need to respond to that. Um, same with like reviews, they're going to get reviews and they're going to know the, the story behind what happened. Should they necessarily be the one to respond to that review? Maybe not because they might be a little too emotional. Someone's calling their baby ugly. They should probably reach out to you and you can help them. Um, but those things that they need to be tied to it because that's, it's their business. And so I think that that balance is something that you have to be really careful on. Yeah, I'm going to pop into, um, because I think uh, what I, I agree with everything that Ashley is saying, um, but I think there's a couple of um, extra nuances I would throw in there. Um, this is important, so you better record. Um, <laughs> but you uh, you heard Ashley say, you know, you have to pick the right channels for the right audience. And I would also argue that you have to understand. You have to be um, sure if you're going to get franchisees managing their own channels, that it's the appropriate thing you want them to do. So we talked about local store marketing. How do you get your franchisees to activate on local store marketing? It's by creating a box that that they're movable in, but, but something, you know, the list can't be 10 things long, right? And so if social media is actively driving revenue into your business, then yes, the franchisees should be on social. If it is not actively driving business, then they don't need to have their own Instagram page. They don't need to have their own LinkedIn page. Um, and I say that because you're going to have franchisees that want that are active on social and want to be on social, and you're going to have franchisees that it, it's going to be a chore. And so you need to take that away um, from the folks who are not adept to it if it's not driving business for uh, your brand. And, and different brands have different strategies. And I would also recommend you have a strategy for your national pages and you understand what your strategy is for your local pages and that it's different so that your franchisees have a clear roadmap of what they're supposed to be posting because just reposting everything that you post is not a strategy. Um, so those are my caveats to what uh, Ashley was sharing. Also to uh, chime in on what Catherine said about, you know, what they knowing, like there's going to be some people that are going to be all in and some people that are not. It's setting the stage early that the amount of work that it is. People think people that do not work in marketing or social media think social media is fun. Right. And it's, just, it's the so fun. I just take some pictures. Or you do Facebook all day. Like right. Oh, you get to just scroll on Facebook and Instagram. Like that's so fun. That's not what it is. Anyone that actually works in it understands that it's not. And so letting them understand the work that goes into it. Because to Catherine's point, if it's going to be a channel that they want to be on just because they think it's fun and cool, they're going to let it die in three weeks when it's no longer fun and cool and they realize how much work it is. And then you have a channel out there that somebody goes and visits a page and realizes there's been no activity. And then it looks like that business isn't legit because no one's doing anything on their social media. So it's thinking about that stuff early, I think is important. Lindsay, any thoughts on social media strategy at, at any level? <laughs> what a loaded question. Yeah, to, to add on to what Ashley just said, something really funny and, and really not a joke. It started internally here. My boss, Tony, made a joke once about calling uh, the marketing department arts and crafts. And then that kind of took off. And so people call me arts and crafts sometimes and, and as like a joke. But I think some people are like, oh, that's actually what you do on Facebook. Right. It's like, I'm like right. no, it's not. Um, but a lot of our strategy um, as it pertains to supporting franchisees and their social efforts, uh, because for our business, a lot does come from social media in terms of leads and contacts. And so it, we, we feel it's very important. So we do a hybrid of supporting our franchisees with what we call corporate content, just branded general wellness or, or, or you know, kind of corporate canned content um, monthly mixed in with what we we encourage is local community, really hyper-focused 
a uh, content, whether it's something as simple as one of our general managers, like literally taking a selfie style video saying, hey, welcome to Stretch Zone. Let me show you behind the doors inside and walking through really organic content that resonates. Because then when a client shows up, they're like, oh, you really are the person from that Facebook video. It's like, yep, that's me, part of the community. So um, that, that's one kind of example. And then another thing that we try to do is um, similar to, to Catherine's comment about the boxes, believe in really firm, but really wide guardrails. So we try to set up our franchisees for success with brand guidelines and templates and assets and things that they can use uh, with flexibility, no pun intended, uh, to make it work at the local level because um, that's what matters, right? If we're all just pushing out corporate canned content that looks the same as some stuff we've got on our corporate page, that doesn't resonate in our markets. And so we wanna make sure that they feel empowered uh, within reason to do local stuff that, that matters to their clients or to their community. You, I can't tell you how many times we've had that same conversation because we do the same, right? We have like the corporate posts that that they're able to post. But then Lindsay, what you were saying with like as a retreat at Massage Heights, like introducing your therapist and like if you're having an event, posting pictures of that so that when they do walk in the door, it feels like that small locally owned business rather than, you know, the the, the big chain as everyone thinks a franchise is. It's like, oh no, like these, these are your community members. Um, Yes, if if they could only just understand that and, and and well and also those posts get the most engagement always like corporate always. quote unquote corporate posts don't get as much engagement as posting about your massage therapist that then that massage therapist sees it they think of it then it's goodwill on them because they're like mm -hmm. oh my business cares about me because they're posting me and they're proud of what I'm doing they then go ahead and share it. Um, their parents probably share it. No matter how old you are, your parents still want to share things when they think that you've done yes. so well. Um, it gets more legs that way and people are engaged with it. Then people start commenting, oh, Julie was my therapist last time I was there and she's great. Those are the ones that get the most engagement. And I think that it's hard sometimes for franchisees to wrap their heads around that because they think that it has to be, anything they take has to be perfect and have the logo on it and all that. On social media, that's one thing like, you don't need to have your logo on things on social media. You're posting it on your page. People know who it is that's posting it. It's not necessary to put your logo on every single thing. Sometimes it makes sense, but not always. So I think sometimes franchisees get so into that mindset and probably our fault because we drill into them, like the brand, the brand, the brand, that they're like, oh, well, I need to do this perfect brand photo when that's not necessarily what's going to be the best. Yeah, I tell franchisees all the time, anytime I've ever trained on social media and having this conversation with our social media manager, it's like, you think about, even from a corporate standpoint, what are the posts that do well? What are the ones that get the most engagement? It's our people, you know, because brands, like when you humanize that brand, I think that's where people feel. And you guys have talked a lot about connection today, which I think is really big. It's like, you know, on your personal social media, you love dogs and babies. Because like, those are the things everyone's most proud of. It's like the same with your business. Like, what are the dogs and babies of your business? Not dogs, but you know, like it is, it's the some, people. Some businesses. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yes, it is so. <laughs> Um, but just those people and like, that's, that's the investment of the brand is those people. So I think that's, that's key and a, and a really good point. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, um, because this is a very hot topic. Um, I know a lot of us attended the three part webinar series that the IFA hosted on AI because it is such a big topic. Um, but from your perspective, what impact is artificial intelligence, if at all, is that incorporating into your marketing efforts? Is it, are you utilizing it? Or are you not? How, how is that being rolled into your plan? Catherine, we'll start with you on the big topic of AI. Yes. And my big take on the big topic is, um, I think it's going to be, uh, something that really, um, challenges marketing teams. Um, I've had, I've had, People um, literally say, you know, can't you just chat GPT that? And I think we've all heard that um, in the meetings that we're having, in the interactions that we're having. And, you know, the answer is yes, I am totally going to chat GPT this to try and make it better. But that doesn't, you know, does it um, uh, help me streamline my time and build more some more time efficiencies? Sure. Um, but it, it certainly does not make anything easier, I would say. Uh, and that's been my experience so far. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think that we all need to be experts in the tools that come out. I think that AI is going to be an incredible tool for us to use. Um, and we're going to have to come up with some talking points as a marketing community on, you know, when we do get approached with, can't you just do that through ChatGPT? Because 
that's ChatGPT is telling you, you can do all of this stuff through it. But at the end of the day, you need some analytical thinking and some human brains on things. Um, and so, you know, I think the challenge for us this year and, and, and forward is going to be, well, why, why, you know, can I use chat GPT, but it doesn't replace me. Um, and, and I don't think anybody's talking about replacing marketing teams at this point, but I do think that we already are operate within a black box that everyone has an opinion on because everyone consumes what we do. And so I think that's going to make that black box a little bit harder to navigate. And I also think it's like, it's to Catherine's point, it's a tool. And it's going to be a tool. And there are so many different things out there. It's not just chat GPT. There are all these other different things. And it's to not let yourself get sucked in by that shiny thing. And just, you could fall down a rabbit hole and just do all things AI all day and do nothing else and have plenty of time that you still need to do it and get it done. And then not, you know, worry about the things that do need that human touch. Very easy to get sucked down that rabbit hole. And it's also very easy to get sucked into people just using it as a buzzword. It's a buzzword. So every vendor partner you talk to, oh, well, we're using AI. How are they using it? Are they using it in a smart way? Are they using it, you know, for example, um, I've worked with um, a vendor partner, Ularity. They use it to place, use machine learning and AI to place ads in that way. And they've been doing it for years. So they have stuff behind it. It's not just something that started today. If you work with somebody and they're like, oh, well, we're using AI to do X, Y, Z, whatever they've done forever. And now all of a sudden it's powered by AI. It's like, well, but did you put the right like securities in place? Did you do what you need to do? Are you doing it just because you can now tell me that I'm working with AI? So I'm going to go and work with you because I'm like, oh, well, they know what they're doing because they're on the trends because they're saying AI. Um, I think that most people on this call, I know that everybody that's, you know, I can see on my screen right now knows not to fall down that rabbit hole, but there might be people in your organization that don't. And there might be franchisees that they get the calls too. They get the calls from partners the same way that you do. People find their names and start calling them. And then they're going to say, oh, well, this vendor, why are we not using this vendor for all of our content creation? Because they said they can do it through AI and it's cheaper. And we don't need to do that photo shoot or we don't need to do that video shoot. Why aren't we doing this? Because it'd be cheaper. And then you can spend my ad fund dollars somewhere else. So it's just making sure that you're smart about it. It's not going away. There's no part of it that's going away. But to Catherine's point, it also doesn't replace. And how do you tell that story to your franchisees and your executive team and everybody else that needs to understand that AI in whatever form can't replace that human touch? And the, like you said, Julie, humanizing the brand, AI is not going to do that. It's going to go the opposite. Lindsay? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I agree entirely with what Ashley and, and Catherine have said. Um, and just small anecdotal things, you know, in, in our system, whenever we deal with something that comes up or, or just an issue or something good, good, better, and different, the kind of the joke on my team is um, job security, AI can't handle this um, because it seems to be the buzzword that everybody wants to say and the catch all or the solve for everything. And, you know, it's absolutely not. And I think that uh, I can't remember if it was Catherine or Ashley that said it. It's just that it's a tool in the toolbox, but it's just one tool. Right. And I think that it's, it's helpful and beneficial in many ways. Um, but it's not the solve all and all be all, right? I think as marketers, we need to be open to learning and seeing how we can optimize this in our respective roles and businesses, because I, I believe there's a different application depending on the business and, and the different goals we're looking to achieve in marketing. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm squarely aligned with, with the, the group that it's not, um, it's not everything and, and shouldn't be thought of as such. Probably a great thing for everyone who's logged in to watch this, that it is not a replacement. So we all, <laughs> we all have job security for a little a little bit longer. Um, so as we get towards the end of our, our conversation here, a um, little bit of a two, three part question as we're starting to round this out. So how, how do you define success in different areas of marketing? Like, what are you tracking? How are you measuring the effectiveness? Because I think, you know, as we give these tips, as we're thinking back on what worked, what didn't, what our biggest wins were and, and, and all of that, it's also looking at not necessarily what, what didn't work. It's more like, how are you looking back and tracking that effectiveness and knowing what to pull forward and what to kind of say like, okay, like this, this maybe isn't something we want to invest a ton, um, a ton more dollars into Catherine. Yeah. And, um, this is a great question because I think at the end of the day, um, 
I actually had a meeting uh, recently and I said, okay, what, what, what are our goals? And, mm -hmm. and as a CFO that was like increased sales, I'm like, well, I got that. <laughs> I get that's what we're supposed to do. Um, but you know, I think that like every brand is going to have um, key performance metrics that they are tracking. And that's going to be your sales, your revenue, your same store sales um, activations. But how do you trickle that down to your marketing team so that you are developing goals and metrics that you can energize your team around. And I think that's that's what you know your, your marketing leaders are going to try and do. You're, you should be giving them your company goals and then your marketing leaders need to break that down into, okay, how am I going to impact these goals? And so you can do that by um, you know, measuring your, your vanity metrics on, on social, you know, all the vanity metrics on website and um, and digital. Uh, but I think, you know, you have to understand what the levers are to impact the goals that you have. And so I'll give you an example. So if your goal is to increase the number of guests that are coming into your location, you're going to increase that number by either increasing the frequency of your ex existing guests and or driving new guests. And if you could break that down to say, okay, then how are we going to drive new guests? And what's going to tell us if we're successful? Because if at the end of the month, you're looking at your reports and you say, hey, great, we, we drove in 10 guests or, or, oh, no, we didn't drive in extra guests. It's too late. You don't know, you know how to reverse course. And so you have to find some metrics that you're measuring to say, hey, is, is what we're doing working? And I think that goes back to what is your strategy and what um, what are the things that you've put in place to then achieve those goals? And so, you know, kind of working backwards, it, the the point I'm trying to make is as you set out, okay, I'm going to run advertising to increase my guests. You need to set goals for that advertising to understand if it's working. It's working if I reach 100,000 people. It's working if I reach 100,000 people and 10,000 of those people visit the website. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, numbers and metrics are are key to marketing success. And if that, if it, they're not part of your vernacular, you need to make it part of your vernacular immediately. Um, and I think the second piece is to not get overwhelmed by it and to really break down what what do I want this to do for me, and then trying to assign numbers to it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and Lindsay, there's the perfect reasoning that we're not just arts and crafts because there's <laughs> and numbers yeah. and all that. How about you and your team? Yeah, I think that um, on even a much more basic kind of elementary level than what Catherine was was talking about, for all different initiatives, whether they're big corporate things, annual budget things, or down to a specific little interaction of a singular event that a franchisee is doing, I, I ask everybody the same thing. How do we define success? And sometimes that's not, you know, a, a buzz KPI word that everybody knows. You know, I, I see all the time, you know, franchisee, oh, I went to this golf outing when we stretched 200 people. It was great. Like, was it? That sounds like a lot of work. What did you get from that? Was that your goal? Was your goal, and maybe that is your goal, is to just show off the service and, and make people aware of it? Or were you capturing leads? Are you following up with them? What cadence are you doing after the fact? Because I, I want to make sure with all everything that we do, whether on the corporate side, the franchisee side, or a hybrid of both, that we understand what is our goal and let's define success. And it's not always a metric. Maybe it's an introduction to a new community or a connection or a networking thing or whatever have you. But I, but so often I find, especially on the franchise level, they'll, they'll do different initiatives without even their own team understanding what is our goal. You'll have three people going out to do an event. You do an event, you spend all day, opportunity cost out of the studio, whatever it is, and then you're done. Well, then what? How did we feel about it? Right? Like this shouldn't really be about feelings. Did we achieve our goal? Yes or no. And if we didn't, why? Right? Let's learn from it. What can we do better? How do we pivot and optimize? And then I think um, always trying to, to understand if we fail and, you know, fail the big, you know, four letter F word. Uh, if we fail, that's okay sometimes, right? Let's just fail fast and learn from it. How do we make it better next time? And also what what failure, and again, hopefully super small micro that doesn't impact anybody's business significantly, but but what can we learn from that that we can make uh, as knowledge available to the system, right? I think that's, that's something that I'm really big on with my team is Mistakes happen, things go wrong, nobody's perfect, don't expect that, but but always let's make sure that we're aligned on how are we being successful, whatever that is and what we're doing, and how are we communicating that, and then on the franchisee side, like I mentioned before, with this kind of good, better, best, or it's really hard to make things really simple, how are we setting our franchisees up for success? And how are making, we making sure that whatever those perhaps metrics that we can define are in summer are loose and, and different, 
clearly communicated because as everybody knows, I think communication is one of the most challenging things in, in any organization, but at least if we, from the start, can have a very clear um, outline, it's really helpful in measuring success and those KPIs. And I know I, I said, <laughs> probably gonna think of carbon things in stone over here at Stretch Zone. Um, <laughs> But as I said earlier, back to basics, with all campaigns and things that we're doing now have, have reverted back to doing a literal one-sheeter. There is a printed one-sheeter that, that is literally, we call it the campaign guide, and it actually says who, what, where, when, why, and how. And that is how we're introducing all the things to, to really take it down to the basic level. And then, of course, have supplementary materials and marketing and all the jazz, right? All the arts and crafts. But if, if um, I think as marketers, and especially in this kind of fast-paced world where all, all focus on what's the new TikTok strategy and the things that you know Ashley and Catherine were talking about before. If we really slow down and say what what are the KPIs that matter for this specific initiative? And like Catherine said, it's ultimately all sales and growing numbers, right? We can agree and, and align on that. But how is this specific initiative contributing to that? And and maybe it's not with a specific number or decimal or percentage increase or growth or whatever have you, but just to be mindful of that, um, to try to start everything with the end in mind or at least a clearly defined um, definition of success. It's like yeah. expectation setting, right? Like if it's the event you were talking about, if it's brand awareness and you wanted 200 people to find out about it, and that was the expectation and goal going in great. But if it wasn't to your point, then it does feel like that four letter F word. Um, Ashley, <laughs> how about you? Um, agree hundred percent with everything that Lindsay and Catherine said, and it's all about setting to your point, Julie, managing that expectation. But then also, I think another key thing is you have, yes, you have to track every, you know, tactic and see what they're doing and, you know, if they're quote unquote working or not, depending on what success is. But then it's also continuing to educate both your internal corporate team and your franchisees on here's what the metrics are for what success is for this tactic. And then how does that play into the bigger picture? Because going back to what Lynn, I think Lindsay and Catherine both said earlier, there is no silver bullet. So was this one thing really not successful because it wasn't one for one, you didn't get, you know, go out and talk to 200 people and get 200 people to enroll. No, not necessarily. So looking at it as, is there more to it outside of this box and that it is playing part of that puzzle because it is a puzzle and it's not going to be just one thing. People need to see things. You know, it used to be the marketing rule of seven that no longer applies. Now, last I heard it was like 35 or something. People have to hear and see you because there's so many different things that are coming at them all the time. And so getting them to understand that every single tactic, don't just immediately, if you think that it is that big four letter word, look at, take a step back and make sure that it really is before you just throw the baby out with the bath water. So this is all, there've been so many key takeaways. I think this has been really, really huge, whether you're an emerging brand or you were a very well-established multi-location all over the country um, brand, this has been great. And I have one more question and it's a super fun one, but before I ask that, um, we are going to leave some time for Q&A at the end, um, but if you are watching, listening, and you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat um, so that once we wrap up the responses to this question, we can go ahead and dive into those and, and get you back to your day on time. But my last question is, if you found out today that you magically had $1 million, $1 million to add to your budget next year, what is the first thing? that you would add to your plan? And Catherine, I'm gonna ask you first. One million, what are you adding or bolstering first? Um, my answer is research because I love data. Um, so I think if I had an extra million dollars, I would do some really deep um, consumer research and, um, and brand positioning research to make sure that uh, to me, research is the foundation to um, really cutting through uh, as, you know, perfect timing. Ashley mentioned, you know, you have to reach out to new guests, call it 35 times, um, existing guests, maybe half that in order to break through. And I think that that means that our messaging and our creative has to be smart. And I don't think you can get smart by having one creative director that's super creative. I think you have to use research. And so I would um, I would go with research. All right, Ashley, how about you? What are you adding first with a million dollars? So I agree with that 100%, but I'm going to take mine just a crazy different way. 
Um, because if I have a million extra dollars that like, I feel like it'd be easier to sell in a crazy idea because people would be like, oh, we have extra and less of this is a, must, a need to have sort of thing. Right. And some of those things that are harder to sell to sell into your franchisees and your team, because they're like, what is that really going to do? So I would do, and I don't know what it would be because I have no idea, but some sort of like crazy stunt. So some sort of big events that you're doing multiple across the country and you're doing, you know, some massive giveaways and something that has a lot of social media value and you can get a lot of PR on because it's something so outlandish. Those are things that are really hard to get buy-in for, um, for obvious reasons, because they cost money and time and who knows what's going to work and not work. You know, it could be a huge flop. It could be massively successful. So because that's so hard to get buy-in for, I would do something like that because it's just extra. And that would, I think, help me pitch it to everybody is, well, we have an extra million. So let's try this thing. And it's not going to impact anything else that we're already doing that we know is successful. I like how wildly different those two answers. <laughs> so Lindsay, are you going to meet them in the middle? Which way are you going? What are you going to do with your extra million? <laughs> I say all the above. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm actually more, more aligned with um, with Ashley, I'd want to do some really sort of special activation with either influencers, ambassadors, professional athletes, different sports, something that that really was outside of what we currently uh, do um, with. I think there's there's so much opportunity that we have yet to really tap with stretch zone that, you know, working on it. Stay tuned. Um, but what we do is so visual. So when you see some of our stretches being performed, for example, if A, a lot of people may not even know what practitioner assisted stretching is, but once you see it, a lot of times you can feel it like, oh, that feels good. I feel like I need that. So I think if we could do some really viral thing with some cool key people um, of some activation that was, you know, totally out of left field and unexpected, that would be really impactful for the brand to say, oh, wow, spread the word. Look at what we got here at Stretch Zone. Awesome. Well, now um, we are going to see if there's been any questions in the chat that our panelists can answer for us. Sam, do you see any that have come through? Yep, I see them now. Here they come. I think are Hater's going. Hater's going to repeat those for us. Yeah. yeah, of course. So we have three questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is: How much weight do you put on impressions of your online campaigns? I think that goes back to what we talked about. Um, it depends. It depends on what the goal is for that campaign. If your campaign is purely awareness, then impressions are important. If your campaign is trying to get people to actually make a purchase, it doesn't matter if a million people see it if they don't take action. So it just depends on what the actual goal of the campaign is, in my opinion. I'd also add that impressions can also be useful when you are trying to right size your marketing spend. So um, I did an exercise eons ago where we kind of assigned a cost per impression to every single marketing tactic. Um, it was a way to normalize the costs of PR versus digital media versus in-store in POP versus um, the wild and crazy activations. So, you know, everything that you do from a marketing perspective is going to have an eyeball assigned to it. Um, impressions also help you um, evaluate like sponsorship opportunities, right? So, you know, it's $20,000 to put your name on, on lights. But then if you can break down like how many eyeballs are going to see that and you can compare that to how much does a digital you know, impression cost me? How much does a um, in-store impression cost me? It's a good way to normalize some of your marketing spend. Um, and and then, you know, back to the point of Ashley's, it really just depends um, on what you're doing. Yeah, I think well, the only thing I have to add to that is that um, I think not all impressions are equal. Right. So when we're thinking of impressions, what what are we like, what are the impressions and what are we measuring them and what is the goal of the campaign, obviously. Um, so when you say how much weight do you put on impressions, I don't know if that question is directed more towards, you know, it really comes back to what I said earlier, state the goal. Um, if you're trying to get leads and then conversions down a funnel, you know, where obviously you need a certain number of impressions to start filling the funnel and pulling people through it. Um, but I don't know that there's a specific weight that I could answer to assign to impressions specifically. All right. And our next question is any ideas of how to engage and capture prospective franchisees for your brand in 2024 outside of print, digital, and search? So any any good outside of that box thinking ideas for prospective Zs? I, I think you got to start where we always start, which is um, customers. Uh, who's your customer? Who is your target franchisee? Um, and where are they? Uh, you know, 
that's where you're going to be able to get creative on what are the other channels. There's not going to be one channel that fits for everyone. Um, but if you can get really targeted on who, what, what, what lifestyle are they living and where are they so that I can, I can try and incorporate myself there. And then also keeping in mind that the timing needs to be right for that type of communication. You know, it's not like a consumer where you are like blasting them and ask, asking them to take an action. You really need to be at their point of consideration, uh, introducing your brand in, in that way. And so you do have to get a little bit more thoughtful um, on what that customer journey is and where you're going to um, insert yourself. I think also for us, you know, part of it is is referrals. A lot of our franchisees come from either existing franchisees or they're clients of ours that are like, wow, I, I, I need this and I want to be part of this. So it's it's really, and when I say referral program, it's not like a formalized thing, at least for us that we have, uh, but it's really how how do we get the word out through our existing network and, and growing that and using some, we've had some great franchisee success stories. We've had some great um, practitioners or general managers of stores that have now become franchisees and, exp and kind of using that as a, a press opportunity and sharing those stories is um, perhaps a little bit non-traditional, not just putting some dollars behind a PPC campaign or something like that. Agree. And we're running short on time. So I'll just say yes to what they both said. <laughs> All right. So we are currently using Canva to share brand assets for social media with our franchisees. Do you have best practices outside of Canva that have worked well for your brand? I think Canva is great. So I'm going to say no. I agree. We use Canva as well. We use um, Sochi. Same. Have you used, and you have used a combination of Canva and Sochi. So, and one final question, according to our digital vendors, leads are up, sales are down strategies for turning the leads into sales. I can take a stab at it. Two things. One, are you targeting the right people? Is your like, cause you're a digital vendor. If they're tracked on leads and leads alone, they can go and get you leads all day long, but are they qualified? Are they leads that are actually going to take an action? So that would be the very first thing that I would do is look at those leads and also look at that relationship with your vendor partner. If they're only, you know, their measure of success is leads, but they're not leads that are converting, that might not be the best relationship that you have because they should be invested in the success of your business. Um, second, what does your customer journey look like once they get wherever you're pointing them? If you're taking them to your website and then you make it very difficult, there's not just a call me now, call now or sign up now or enroll now or whatever your vernacular is for your business, um, they might get lost on your website. So if you're getting them to your website or wherever you need to be and then they're not taking an action, there might be a problem with your content or the flow of your customer journey. I think we, a quick, just aside, I know short on time, uh, leads cost you money, sales make you money, right? So just to dovetail what Ashley's saying, uh, people seem to be, uh, for a while, were consumed by lead count and how many leads I was getting. And, and I'm talking about defining success. I'm like, team, I don't know that this is the right thing that we're measuring. Let's talk about this funnel. What is the conversion rate from lead to booking or lead to client? And then the, let's analyze even further the clients that come from digital leads, for example, what is what what are they spending? Is that higher or lower than some of the other marketing avenues that we have? And let's analyze this and see, because you know it's great if you tell me that you got me 100 leads, but if only one becomes a client, that's not successful. I have nothing to add. I literally had these conversations this week. <laughs> All right. Well, first, huge thanks to the IFA. This has been a really, really wonderful conversation. And then a huge, huge thank you. So grateful to Lindsay, Ashley, and Catherine for all of the insights, knowledge, and just really key takeaways that we're able to take back, like I said, to, to these 2024 plans. Um, very, very grateful for everyone that tuned in. And I'm now going to turn it back over to Sam. Thank you, Julie. And uh, this this came to everybody today from the uh, uh, council, the marketing council of the franchise or and our leadership pod of that council. Uh, Ashley Schutz puts this stuff together. It's an amazing job. Uh, I always take a few notes when we have these webinars and these educational engagements. Um, very rarely have I gone through two pages of notes, and I literally took two pages of notes. Ladies, you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, if you didn't have two pages of notes, um, you miss a lot of great, great nuggets. But as Hayter mentioned at the beginning of this uh, webinar, this has been recorded and you'll have a chance to go back and, and uh, 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 review all this information and, and uh, have your uh, teams and your companies review this information. And um, lastly, <clears throat> make sure the IFA convention is coming up in 2024. The early bird registration is December the 15th to get there. 
and we will be having a franchise or forum meeting uh, at the annual convention. So with that, um, thank you, ladies. Julie, great job. Y'all did fantastic today. And I want to wish everybody, since we uh, probably won't see each other until uh, IFA convention, wish everybody uh, a happy and, uh, and a healthy holiday season. Thanks for joining us.